And we are on. Are we? Let's see. Yes, we are. Whoa. Hello, everybody. Let me send the links to all the appropriate places. Good morning, everybody. Evening or whatever time of day it is where you at. Good morning, everybody. E Whoops, sorry. Um, hopefully everyone survived well. It's the end of the week. Tomorrow is Saturday. Happy day. Am I right? All right. Posting it to the chat. Let's go. Good morning. Oh, CR's first? No, Alina is the first. Nice. Please, if it's not too much trouble, just, you know, spread the message, send it to your grandma. Uh, we also, I also posted this on um, Instagram. So if it's not too much trouble, um, go ahead and maybe, um, you know, go ahead and repost it. Can you hear me just fine, guys? Is volume okay? Do you need to make me louder or not louder? How about this? It should be a little bit better. Volume is up. Is that okay? <laughs> I'll, I'll put the gain a little bit more. Okay, volume is okay, good. It just somebody told me that the volume is a little bit quiet. So I don't know if that's true or not. It's fine, okay, cool. All right, so we're gonna just, you know, as regularly wait for 13, or I mean three, not 13, three more minutes maybe until 11.05. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and if if the sound is good, that's good. Yeah, let's double check. Blah, 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 blah. Speaking awesome, epic words of wisdom. Sound okay? <laughs> Some people say that they cannot hear anything. The sound is perfect. Okay, for people who are in Discord, um, yeah, join the YouTube link. We have two more minutes till we start the epic, epic journey of the day. Okay, all right. You can hear me good, that's good. In case you don't, just, you know, make make the make the volume louder today it's actually really cold crows finally left me alone for today even though they were uh, yelling in the morning so yeah okay youtube is working fine good good all right i think we should start internet is good today so if we get if we get any interruptions just you know wait a little bit I have to run around scream at the ceiling and connect to my mobile phone <laughs> all right so we should start I think the doink all right All right, welcome everybody to lecture number three. Today is going to be a very exciting day because we're going to be diving into animation, game, and live action pipeline. What do artists do in the pipeline? What's the roles, right? What's the order? How everything starts and how everything ends, right? And how to survive through all of this madness. Uh, a few days ago on Wednesday, we had a really good guest speaker, Borja Pena. A really good friend of mine and you guys loved him that's great he talked about a few very important topics right we looked at the project from a director's perspective and uh, we had limited time we didn't talk about everything in depth but you had a pretty good idea of the inside cooking in, in, the, in the kitchen 
<laughs> of the animation pipeline, right? So today we're gonna cover multiple things, even though our main focus is gonna be animations because that's where I work, right? And we're gonna talk a little bit about movies, a little bit about games and what the differences are. To be honest, there's more similar things than there is differences. And we'll talk about the differences a little bit later. So, pipeline. Oh boy, one of my favorite incredible shots from the, from the animation. So, let's talk about in the beginning, right? In the beginning, each story, and we're going to have Incredibles as an example, right? Starts with a, an idea, right? We're going to represent the pipeline like a little point A to point B journey, and I'm going to be writing everything here with my cold hands. Hopefully it's going to warm up by the end of the day. So, a director, a person, a company, a group of people decide what they're going to do. You know, they get an awesome epiphany, right? Maybe they were showering, maybe they were just, you know, um, you know, having lunch together, for example, the story of Nemo from Pixar and Toy Stories. They started from a bunch of artists sitting and eating nachos at the cafeteria after they wrapped up some, I don't remember what project they wrapped up, but they were like, you know what, let's do something fun. You know, they came up with Toy Story. They came up with Finding Nemo, Bugs Life, right? It was something simple. What if, what if toys came, came alive, right? What happened? in the fish world and stuff like that. So in, in the beginning, it's an idea, right? A good question, what if, right, an idea. After that, an idea gets brewed, right? It doesn't really matter if it's film, animation, or games, right? Everything starts with an idea. So, and that person can then, right, go and find sponsors for that idea. Usually that person is the director themselves, so for example, in in an example of the, the Incredibles, it's Brad Bird, super cool director, right? And he has an idea, right? What if we t tell a story of a superhero family, right? Simple statement, right? We're not gonna go too much into detail. So Brad Bird, you know, he goes and finds a pitch, makes a pitch, right? And that's when we get to materializing our idea for the first time we're going to a thing called Pitch Bible, right? Every project before it gets greenlit, right? Needs to go through a Pitch Bible phase, right? Because you need to go and show it to a bunch of scary executives, right? Who are, you know, money managers, you know? And they sit around a giant table and look at you menacingly, you know? And you come to them and, you know, their office probably looks like an evil layer with fire all around. And you bow before them with your little idea and say what they think, right? So pitch Bibles, right? Remember last time we talked about uh, Despicable Me pitch Bible, how Sergio Pablos uh, pitched his project to Illumination and they made Despicable Me out of it. So for example, today I have... Um, idea for the Peach Bible of Stranger Things because, you know, today, um, the, the second season, I mean, second part of the season drops, right? And I thought it would be interesting for you to see how Stranger Things pitch book looked like. And I found it on the internet. Uh, in the beginning, it was called Montauk, right? And it, Peach Bibles usually consist of, you know, uh, the log line where everything hap is happening, right? And the general tone, then they would go and talk about the main, main plot lines, how the world will look like, the main story plots, right? And then we'll have like uh, real life or existing project references because studio usually don't like something completely new, right? And here, remember guys, you are compiling a mood board. So pitch book, it's kind of like a mood board, but with words. Right, so how the main cast is gonna feel like, right? How uh, the main protagonist is gonna feel and look like, right? What the world is gonna look like. So the pitch bible is giving an overall overview of the project. And like as you can see here, it's not very, it's not very long. It's 23 pages, right? And the purpose 
of the pitch Bible is this, right? Is to make sure that executives understand what is your story, what you're trying to get, how expensive it's going to be, right? What the target audience is going to be, blah, 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 blah. All of those things, right? So you compile of pitch Bibles and pitch Bible can be different. So for example, here for a live action movie, right? They compiled a bunch of, you know, shots from existing movies and compiled them, Frankenstein them together to kind of show the idea. For example, Taika Waititi, uh, when he did a Thor Ragnarok movie, he, instead of a pitch Bible, he just created a video, you know, and he cut into that video a bunch of movie beats from different movies and put the... Um, the super uh, iconic track on top of it, you know? And he presented that as a, basically, as a pitch for his vision for Thor Ragnarok, right? So there's different ways, but the common consensus is this, that it should present an overall idea uh, to the potential investors, because usually there's multiple investors, or one big investor, one big company, or multiple, depends. Right, or publishing house, stuff like that. Uh, but it consists of images, right? So that's the earliest where artists could actually participate, you know, in in the project, right? Nothing should, nothing started yet. Everything only the only thinking about it. So, for example, our guest Borja that was here on Wednesday, I did a couple of pitch book bibles with him. You know, and he will come to me and he say, hey, I have this idea, the script itself, right, or logline, right, it's still kind of like in development, but there's like a few notes that are trying to do, right, and he would invite like a writer on, he would invite a couple of illustrators on, and he would also um, like maybe invite like, um, like a second writer, like as many people as he needs to compile something really fast and shortly so that he can present it to a studio and then the studio can like go and find the budget uh, and stuff like that. So for example, I uh, and Toby and Felipe, for example, we did like a couple of keyframes just like Borja showed last time, right? That illustrates um, so, for example, here, like how the world looks, maybe like um, how the family dines for The Incredibles, for example, right? What the location looks like, for example. Uh, those are production environment art, but something similarly can be done for, for the pitch book, right? And then he perfects his pitch to the studio and makes a nice like Google Slides presentation, right? And then he goes and does the performance of a lifetime <laughs> in front of executives, right? He's entertaining, the story is awesome, he's involved. Let's say they're like super ecstatic about this, like, yeah, this is a great idea. They're, they're waving their dollar signs. It's going to bring us much, much more money. Uh, hopefully there's like one dude in there that's like, yeah, it's a great story, right? And then, right, they give like, a final green light or they say okay let's go into pre-production right pre so this is the pre-production phase technically what we're talking about here could be part of the pre-production right but it's kind of like uh, unknown waters you know area because project projects can be in this phase for years, you know, they could, the scripts could be already bought with the pitch Bible uh, and the presentation and an ID and the IP is sold to those companies. And sometimes the companies would buy the ideas or the scripts, not because they want to make it, but just because they don't want other companies to make those projects. So just a little bit of an insight, right? This is very dangerous area. I know a few artists, friends of mine who pitched their projects, like this could take like 10 years before it goes, right? But the project can be even canceled in pre-production. So then we go into pre-production, right? Pre-production is pretty simple. We got a green light. Hopefully we'll have a finished script, right? 
script. It's finished. Um, and everyone loves it. Maybe it is developed still as we go through the uh, visual pre-production, but there has to be at least some information that we can base it on. So for example, Brad Bird, before let's say he did the first draft uh, of the final script, he might have an outline, right? An outline, it's basically like in act one, this happens, right? In act two, this happens. In act three, this happens. And the story ends. And they kind of know um, what the main plot is going to be in a few locations. So, for example, there's a lot of times when the projects were actually made. Like for example, you know, the Halloween one that... Um, uh, Tim Burton did uh, with uh, Jack, Jack the Pumpkin guy. Uh, that was a musical. Uh, for example, in the beginning, they didn't even have a script. And the first script that they did for the uh, for the Jack the Pumpkin uh, movie, I forgot what it's called. The first script was not written because the scriptwriter spent all of his money on cocaine and drugs and disappeared. So before the script was made... What they did, actually, because they knew it would be a musical, and in the musical there was a lot of story. It was story-driven songs, right? They started with music. So, actually, the songwriter wrote a bunch of songs, and that acted kind of like a script, right? They would, they would, they would start visualizing, pre-visualizing whatever was there. Because every pipeline is different. There is there's an ideal of an ideal pipeline. Right? Nightmare Before Christmas. Thank you. Uh, yes. So, and there's such a thing as an ideal pipeline. I will try to kind of give you the formula, but every time different stages can go back and forth and stuff like that, and they can, they can either go uh, parallel to each other, right? So, for example, artists will start and script will start and will go at the same time, but sometimes Ideally, if the script is already complete and then they have something to base it off and then they will base the visuals. So let's go, let's go back a little bit. Script is ready or an outline and the script is written as we do the visuals, right? And usually the early visual development team comes in, right? Super early previous, some, somewhere right here. So who would come in? Uh, character designers, right? Would come in 100% right to just to develop like how for example robert parr looks like from uh, the mr incredible right like this is early early sketches of uh syndrome right and then like how would like the turnarounds look and his facial expression stuff like that so character designers 100 percent come in super early on right and then we could have keyframe artists right also come in really really early here and just develop you know a few cool key moments of someone punching someone uh, of the uh, of the of the key story elements, right? Environment artists can also come in and also do some exploration and move things, right? Uh, another thing is about that storyboard artist, right? So, for example, different directors work differently. So, for example, if the script is already ready, right? Ideally, ideally, if the script is ready, it then the storyboard artist picks it from there and just starts working, right? But sometimes the script is not ready, and there's actually two professions. There's storyboard artist, right? And then there's story artist. What's the difference between those two, right? Both of them are storyboarding profession, right? But one storyboard artist is working directly from the script and story artist he writes the story without the script but through storyboards so story artists are actually technically script writers themselves but without text only through visuals so some directors would like to have a really good story artist that talks to the director all the time, kind of knows the story and can work without a script, right? And some directors like to have a finished script and then just have a storyboard artist and storyboard artist only works from the script and, and kind of builds things on top of that and makes it better, right? So we have characters, environments, keyframe arts, story, 
storyboard artists and story artists, depending on, um, and this will develop probably at the same time, that and story artist that works directly with with the director, right? And then we have some, let's say the storyboard is done, right? Storyboard is done, and we have the script, you know, locked in almost a hundred percent, for example, right? Or let's say even fifty percent. So for fifty percent, we know exactly what's going to happen, what the staging is going to be, what the locations are, and stuff like that. And now we can finalize, you know, we can we can start to finalizing our character designs, finalizing our environments, and designing more specific things. Right, the storyboard is already, let's say, halfway done, or a few little uh, storyboard things are done. Right, let's say we have a few scenes storyboarded already. Right, and that's when the color key artist can come in, right, and put some color, right, into the into the storyboards. Like for example, in Incredibles, they were, they had an incredible color key artist. Who really, really briefly, you know, this is this is this is even prior to the storyboarding phase, right? This is somewhere here, you know. A color key artist knew the story and basically, you know, with super graphic shapes, described the whole color palette of the whole movie, right? There's hundreds of those frames, and then when the movie, let's say, this is the final storyboard, right? Before the 3D team starts lighting anything, right? So 3D team will get color keys like this that will be painted on top of the storyboard, right? The color key artist would find the most emotional moments that needs description to the 3D lighting team and we'll pick them and we'll do a, a, few, a few color keys that 3D team can then light in real life, you know? And like, for example, after the storyboarding phase, right? This phase and after the color scripting phase, you have to understand that um, production itself, let's say if the shots are approved and we have an approved shot of, for example, um, Jack, uh, not Jack, what's his name, Flash, um, running through the forest, right? And they already made it in 3D and the lighting is there. So 3D animators would pick up and start animating the shot. So they will have a storyboarding shot and then they will replicate the environment in 3D. Uh, before the environment is replicated in 3D, they would do a clean concept art for it, right? And after that, they would do lighting, and that's when color keys come in, right? After that, right, when the shot is approved and stuff like that, right, they would just save it and send it to the editing room, right? But before all of that, we're only covering the visual aspect of it. That, that's what we do, right? Before all of that, when the script is ready, here, right? And there's some final lines that are approved and all the moments work, they will go into voiceovers. Voiceovers. They will have, they'll hire actors and they will just speak into the microphone, you know? Be in the studio and there'll be director on the other side with a script and they will do like a million takes and then and then the director will be like yeah that's it or that's not it and they will get the right emotion out of the actor and again different pipelines this stage can go differently like for example in the movie Rango that was voiced by Johnny Depp what they actually did is for the voiceover sessions, they actually had all of the actors on set in costumes, you know, with guns and a few props and maybe like a carriage here and there. And there's a lot of them and they would have all microphones. They would act and record the voice lines, the temporary voice lines, sometimes the final voice lines while they were acting. And there was an actual cameraman filming them and then they use this footage to influence their storyboarding the acting because it was all recorded animators could get inspired by let's say movements on Johnny Depp and then actually animate an actual shot on a computer right uh, sometimes like for example in Desolation of Smaug because technically movies these days are basically animated cartoons now because there's so much 3D for the dragon itself right 
Uh, sorry that it's so ugly. <laughs> uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, he not only when he was doing the voiceovers, he was doing facial expressions that they used as an inspiration. But then he also had a mocap soon on to influence the facial expression stuff like that. And then uh, sometimes in 2D animation, right, uh, the footage of the actors voicing the characters would be sent out to the animators, and that would, in, that would, that would, that would, the acting itself would slip in, in into the into the final 2D animation of the character, right? So, for example, especially in old movies like Aladdin and uh, Finding Atlantis, you can kind of see the you know the physical attributes even or uh, you know mannerisms of actual voice actors that do them. Okay, so let's recap. Idea, pitch Bible, executives happy, green light, script, storyboard, right? And when script and storyboard are at least start, then we have some visual information to start pre-visualizing. So then we can think about characters, then we can think about environments, keyframe moments, color, and stuff like that, right? So visual development, for the most part, right? It's somewhere here right in early pre-production that's when like kind of like bare bones visual development happens right that's pre-production right when actual production happens right production so that's where that's when we prepare all of this stuff when actual production happens the artists themselves they are basing their artwork on the shoulders of the Viz Dev team. The same Viz Dev team can go further on, you know, and basically become the production artist. Do if they can do clean work, they can do clean environments. It doesn't have to be rough and stuff like that. So, but all of the production relies on the pre-production of the visual development artist, and then there is uh, post-production, right? In post-production, it's usually Final touches, render, final editing, final score for the music and sound design, stuff like that, uh, and then marketing and stuff like that. So, for example, what artists do in post production, uh, 2D artists, probably the only thing they can come up with is like they can do and, and title screen, for example. Uh, while everything is is going, there's a lot of times when uh, when movies marketed and all the pre-production production is done, the movie is basically made. They could hire a separate team to do like end titles. Uh, another thing is like movie posters. You know, depending on the project, sometimes the marketing material will be done by the you know by the 2D team. Stuff like that. look at uh, you know. Look at the Incredibles. They had well, basically a 2D little animation at the end of their Incredibles movie. Look at Hotel Transylvania. It has a very stylized and really, really cool and interesting end, end screen. Um, sometimes productions would use, you know, pre-production art, like in Mandalorian, they would have, you know, keyframes and stuff like that. Uh, but there's some jobs, like for example, back in the days when the movies were made uh, without any digital cameras and everything was on film and there was almost no digital art or none whatsoever, all the movie posters, they were done traditionally. So technically it was, uh, you know, it was a profession within itself. So, yeah. So that's 3D animation, right? From kind of 2D, right? Script, characters, characters, environments, keyframes, storyboard and color script after that. Sometimes animations, like for example, if we have a 3D background, require matte painters that would do like skyboxes and like everything that is super in the background and not 3D, that would do that. But after pre-production, there's almost, in pre-production, there's almost no 3D, right? In production, 2D team, right? And it feeds information to the 3D team. Right, so if we make a character in pre-production and then we finalize it in production, right, and it's finalized, we'll give it to the 3D team, right? Same thing with environments, same thing with props, 
and everything, everything else, right? Um, then the 3D team will just replicate everything in 3D if it's a 3D pipeline, right? And they will start animating and do a rough animation without any lighting, right? Based on the storyboards, right? And then color key artist comes in, does all the lighting. Let's say they animated all of the shots and then they give it to the 3D lighting team, right? And they will do the final renders, final lighting, VFX, and stuff like that. Okay, so this is the 3D animation pipeline, right? And after everything is done, there's a huge marketing campaign that can cost almost as much as the whole movie, right? And everything goes well, they sell it in theaters, or streaming services, right? And hopefully those guys that trusted in the project will quadruple their money, right? Because that's the business of animation, right? Some think it's bad because I think the focus lately was only on money and not on art. And before that, people made money to make more animations. And nowadays, people make animations to make more money, not the other way around, right? So sometimes the system is getting abused for the wrong reasons, in my opinion, right? So, for example, the first Toy Story that was done by Steve Jobs, he wanted just to, you know, he wanted to see what technology can do. It was the first 3D animated film in history. Right. If we look at the movie, you know, Finding Atlantis that didn't do that well in the box office, it is, in my opinion, like really, really, it's, it's, it's kind of like a pillar of animation. Like they, they wore T-shirts that said <laughs> more explosions, less singing or something like that, because they were tired of a Disney formula that basically corrupted the system. And the formula was working because it was bringing money, but they wanted more creative stuff. So. But at the end of the day, it is a business and people have to make money because without money, we can't make animations because animations are very expensive. So this was an example of 3D animation pipeline. With 2D, it's almost about the same, but there's no 3D involved. So for example, when there'll be same thing, visual development, pre-production, right? Characters, keyframes and stuff like that. And storyboards, right? But then they would give the final designs to the animators. Right, and with 2D, there's like uh, 2D layout, 2D environments, right? You have to pan the camera, uh, like not with actual 2D, but build it all like in After Effects, and it's usually layered, right? So we have mountains on one layer, you have this on another layer, and then you have like clouds on another layer, right? And characters can be doing here, and they'll be moving those. So that's, that's kind of like, that's already compositing. Um, yeah, in terms of like 2D pipeline, the only difference is there's no 3D, right? And then there's such thing as, uh, for example, for Klaus, right? There's, uh, there's 2D rough animation. Uh, then there's cleanup, cleanup, poor cleanup artist that would get super cool, uh, rough animation from the masters then the cleanup artist will clean it up, right? Or in between them, because rough 2D artists, they would only animate rough, you know, on twos and, and stuff like that uh, without, you know, extra detail because they wouldn't have the time. Just imagine for every second you need to do 16, you know, 12, 12, 24 uh, frames per second. You can do less than that, but it's a lot of, it's a lot of, it's a lot of drawings, right? And after cleanup, right? Sometimes they would have light 2D lighting uh, team. So for example, in the movie Klaus, they developed a whole lighting system to uh, make their movie look 3D, right? With 2D layers and that was all frame by frame, even though the AI did calculate the in-betweens, but it was still a uh, labor of love. Um, in terms of like, what's more expensive, 2D or 3D animation, it all depends, right? Some people say 2D animation is more expensive, but, and that's why people logically, and the evolution of animation was that 3D medium is now our everything, 
But I think that people gave up on 2D a little bit too soon for the novelty of 3D. But now we're kind of going back a little bit. We're mixing the two. So now we actually can see not only 2D pipeline and 3D pipeline, we can have actually in between. So for example, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse, right? It had 2D and 3D in it. Uh, they painted uh, some frames in the in-betweens between 3D and uh, they, they painted with 2D shapes. They played with the frame rate a little bit. So they had a lower frame rate for an unexperienced Spider-Man and a higher frame rate, 24 frames per second for more experienced one. So let's say the, you know, the action of the unexperienced Spider-Man seemed to be you know, much more choppy and weird and stuff like that. And, and, then, and the more experienced Spider-Man, he felt more smooth you know his his actions were more smooth and stuff like that okay so that's 2d and 3d we might have a little bit more things pop pop out as as i go in terms of detail but now let's go into live action right live action is the same thing script uh pitch bible green light let's go the only difference is they have to understand that whatever we're designing for a 3d movie or a 2d movie Right, but here we have to build everything in 3D. So every time we concept or previsualize something in production, right, or from pre production to production, it has to be built in 3D. Here on our live action movies, back in the days, they had to build actual sets, right? So they would have to build either little Minas Tirith for like establishing shots and for like close up shots if, if camera was somewhere here. They would have an actual, let's say, wall built somewhere, right? But they had to be smart about it because just imagine, like, you have a limited budget. You can't build the whole Rivendell, you know? They did build some of it, right? But it, it was carefully planned with camera positions. Like, for example, sometimes they would have, you know, Bilbo standing here, and then they would have, you know, buildings in the background. And that was not a matte painting, that was a little miniature that looked like this. And it stood like, I don't know, five meters from it. But through camera illusion, that set looked big, right? But everything that we do, you have to understand that our job as a visual development artist, right, is to create that world with a story in mind. And then it has to be actually practically made, right? You have to understand that in the pipeline, right, you have to take care of a person that goes in front of you because if you're gonna make the person in front of you life's much, much harder, the production, that's, that's not gonna go very well, right? So every time we think about this linear progression of pipeline, we have to understand that we are paving the way for the person in front of us, right? If I am painting a keyframe, I have to understand that, all right, or a character in 2D, some poor soul has to animate it frame by frame, right? So I'll try to make the person's uh, life in front of me much easier by not like putting too much detail into his costume. But we're gonna talk about character design for 2D animation in the character uh, week, right? For example, for keyframe artists, right? You know that this moment is gonna be then taken over by a storyboard artist. So you will try to include as many interesting things in the layout, you know, for the storyboard artist to play around with. Or you can do like, you know, a little kind of like overview, overview from the top, you know, where the character goes through the gates, like what, where's the other end? Is there stairs? Is there no stairs? Because then, let's say this is the character. The storyboard artist can take your concept, right? place some cameras here and there and plan and plan things out and he won't need to do your job right so when we're thinking about pipeline you have to understand where do you fit in this so as you guys listen to this please keep in mind where you think you'll be most useful right for example let's think about Misha as an artist right so Misha is not good at polished stuff Right. I hate polishing stuff. I hate rendering and I'm really good at idea generation and just go, go, go test out as many ideas as possible. Right. 
But production itself, when you're actually doing final, you're doing final designs, you're doing final environments and final characters, precision, you know, and final rendering skills and texturing and stuff like that. It's really crucial. So that's why I'm never in like clean production looking things. No, no illustration, no like final character designs. I am really good here in a blue sky this they call it this I think we can merge this this is called blue sky uh, I guess phase it's like when anything goes right and blue sky phase you know pre-production can be like I know it looks really small here but pre-production can last for like four years right it could it could last five years ten years it depends on the movie you know because for example for spider-man to spider-verse it took him a whole year to do the first eight minutes or one minute i don't remember right even 30 seconds of clean animation so for the whole year they were just you know exploring different approaches to how their film may look you know and lord of the rings you know pre-production itself which is script writing, set building. So for example, in, in the movie, The Hobbit, they built the whole uh, lake town, you know? They built a miniature set of Minas Tirith. I couldn't find it, sadly. Uh, oh yeah, here's the Minas Tirith, yeah? So th th they built a huge mini miniature set, right? So, because the thing is, shooting the movie itself or making the movie itself is only gonna be as good as you're planning. So, pre-production phase and finding your best variation of your movie is one of the most important and crucial parts of world building and story crafting right because there you're like what if i approach it like for example uh the movie Emperor, emperor's new groove where the emperor turned into a llama right and they went on adventures with pacha that movie was in pre-production for like two Two and a half years and the story was actually i think about two brothers and some kind of uh god of sun if i'm not mistaken it was some kind of like this epic and they even made music for it and the storyboard was there and at the end of year two they're like this story sucks <laughs> or someone was fired or something like that because the, exec the executive didn't like where the movie was going because they thought it would not sell and there was no heart and no nothing just fell apart so what they did they scrapped the entire two years or a year i don't remember exactly of pre-production and they started over and i think in like six to seven months they had the time to completely rewrite the story they came up with the story of what Emperor's New Groove is it now, right? It's the story of Pacha and the Emperor and how Emperor is gaining his soul and finally is falling in love with his own kingdom and he's not so ignorant anymore, right? So for a lot of the times for the movies, for the movie industry, right? Pre-production can take, I don't know, three years, for example, right? For, so for example, the Mad Max story, right? I don't remember how long the actual shooting went of the movie, but I think like shooting was like six to seven months maybe, and pre-production was like two years, right? Because they, first of all, they have to build all the cars, do all the storyboards. They have to figure out like what the locations are and stuff like that. And that's the difference would say, for example, with movies and animation. Animation, we can create our own world, right? With movies, we can't. We can build, build sets, we can do something in 3D, but most often than not, there's such a guy uh, as, as location scout. So they will go throughout the world and pick out locations that are similar to the pieces of concept art that they created for that world. So for example, if they have a desert, like, okay, in which desert are we gonna go, right? For example, in Lord of the Rings, <laughs> one of the moments where Frodo and Sam are running from the orcs beyond uh, beyond the walls of Mordor is was shot in the backyard of some random dude in Washington because they're like we have no time let, let's shoot it in the backyard you know and that's that's the main difference between 2D and you know uh, like 
animated movies and real life movies because in animated movies we have more freedom to create whatever we want right and with well with 3d movies nowadays like for example marvel universes the movies they're basically animated films if you see what the real life footage compared to <laughs> cg animation is in marvel movies i'm pretty sure the ratio is like i don't know maybe 60 to 40 percent if not 80 to 20 percent i have no idea i need to i need to check out actual numbers right um yeah so movies are fascinating right uh we didn't even talk about 3d sculptors right we're only talking about 2d 2d teams so there's remember i talked to you about, about there's like there's traditional sculptors and there's 3d sculptors right and in animation Traditional sculptors can pre-visualize and then give it to 3D sculptors and scan it around and turn it into a rigged, um, into a rigged 3D doll. If people don't know what rigging is, it's when you construct a hull, let's say a Viking, in 3D and you can turn him around. So what riggers do, they will put uh, bones inside the 3D model with control groups right and for example if you push on this button let's say the arm goes up or the face goes down right sometimes you can just you know just click and drag the hand and it will change position and stuff like that and it will do an animated so that's what the riggers do uh, of course there's no such thing in 2d well there is such thing as programs as after effects where you can do skeletal stuff but this is getting a little bit too complicated. This whole thing already looks like a crazy scientist. <laughs> He's talking. All right, so we talked a little bit about 2D animation and 3D animation. We talked a little bit about live action, right? The only difference is we have to build the sets sometimes by hand, right? We have location scouts and pre-production can go a really long time, right? And then the actual shooting on set with actual camera can go sometimes for a few weeks, you know? Um, because we had all of this, all of this preparation. So now games. Games are also stories. Games have characters and environments and games pre-production goes something like this. I worked on a few mobile games, right? Mobile, PC, different genres. They have a little bit of, you know, differences in between them. But for the main part, it's the same thing. What the world is, what the story, right? Um, find a sponsor or get a green light or sometimes develop this game on your own and then when it's developed a certain stage then you will sell it to someone or find a publisher who would give you more money but then you'll start wide again you'll get the same pre-production as here you know a bunch of artists are gonna develop the main characters the main feel the look of the game you know and, th and start thinking about gameplay the only thing that is going to be different from 2D animation and 3D animation in live action is like we're going to have actual game designers, right? Game designers is a very, <laughs> I would say, mysterious profession. How many game designers do you know? I know one or two, maybe three, you know? It's a profession that is using a lot of like human psychology, right? How do I prep, or, you know, how do I place like a cube and cube here that you know the player is going to jump or where it's going to he going to go later on for how long the level is lasting what the atmosphere in the level will be you know and it's it's super hard you know but sometimes you know art itself could give some ideas to the game developers or to the director who directs the game developers like in a painting there'll be some cool, super cool scene of a character jumping and you'll be like you know what we need this level where the character needs to jump around uh, a lot for example right uh but overall it's all the same thing right you have characters environments that's is given to the 3d team the 3d team do all the assets and another thing you might have like ui ux uh artists uh so user experience user interface uh, artists who would be like where do we position the buttons and stuff like that and then you have play testers so for example we're gonna talk about god of war right before 
like you can even start a running around your game like there will be a bunch of people who are doing like awesome environment pieces like this exploring a few characters here and there you know and then giving it to the 3d team and they might do like a fast mock-up of that but before all the assets are even made and the characters are modeled you're just gonna have a dummy target you know on empty you know 3d floor with like some preset axe running around you know and that's going to be your kind of base build and then when the 2d and 3d team has already done everything then they would place it into the game level by level until you have the final product right so the main thing that we need to get out of this lecture with you guys is what kind of person are you right do you like brainstorming the most and you like self-directing yourself a lot and you know sitting on calls and and, and coming up with ideas and, and going wild i'm kind of selling the idea that bizdev is awesome that's because that's where i am <laughs> so um but you know or you like more structure like for example that some people already did something before you and you would like to finalize it you know and you would like to dive deep into the details, you know, with amount of creativity, of course, but less unknown, right? More known world type of a deal, you know. Or uh, you would like to, like, you know, maybe you'd even like this dev, right? Because, like, you can go into storyboarding, right? Uh, maybe you would like to go into 3D modeling because... 3D modeling is super awesome, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're a really good 3D modeler, you'll get lots of jobs because, you know, there's not, there's some 3D modelers out there, but there, that's not a lot, really good ones, you know, you'll get a job a lot, you'll get a lot of jobs, you know, or maybe out of all of this, you're like, you know what, I kind of really like this, yeah, the idea guy, I want to be the director, you know, that, you know, that, that goes and, <laughs> and tries to you know conquer all of this madness that is going on in the pipeline right so yeah try to understand you know where you're gonna fit the most i'm gonna kind of discuss a little bit that the challenges that people get so for example the role of a previous guy in the beginning of everything right there's a lot of unknown nothing is planned out the sky is the ceiling so you can go pretty far and wide you know in terms of ideas and everything else and sometimes it can be crushing you know you're just sitting into the look into the monitor and you're like i can do whatever that i want where do i start and you know what sometimes this responsibility is too much you know and that's when i go to the director and i throw some ideas around and we and we, and we see what works best right um, but for the most part, in my opinion, the best visual development artists are self-directing ones that can listen to a lot of information. I would say great organizers, right? So if I would say what a door is in a nutshell, you can say it's a portal <laughs> on the opposite side of the wall, for example, right? So you can, you can take information and then spit it out with a different twist, right? You are really good at self-directing. You're really good at coming up with ideas, brainstorming, and associative thinking. You really like teamwork, and you like bouncing ideas around. So that's what pre-production for me is, right? A lot of teamwork and stuff like that. If you like production stuff, same thing applies to production, honestly, the production artist, right? Same things. You can have a rough color keys and and you know render a beautiful painting of a, of a of a city town you know like cats and boots type of a style with with interesting uh, scenery and stuff like that you are really good at texturing and communicating dimensions and you think about the 3d team in front of you and all of your concepts are going to make into 3d uh, and, and be fleshed out right um, you're going to flesh out you know final look of the movie you know you're gonna you're gonna create magnificent environments and maybe even more polished keyframes right 
Um, so if you really like polished work and like, um, you would enjoy this position a lot, right? Other things like post-production stuff like that, it doesn't really matter, right? Because not that it doesn't matter for the movie. I mean, same things apply to you from those two, right? Uh, from those two two things. So, so yeah, I think I think that I talked about the basic things. Now we can dive a little bit, you know, into like specifics. So, for example, each project, which would be like the two D or three D pipeline, uh, has specific genre or specific rules that they play by, right? For example, in 2D animation, you have to understand that you can go, for example, too detailed on the characters, right? Because it's gonna be animated frame by frame. And if you're gonna make it too complicated, the 2D animator is gonna die, probably, <laughs> in his studio because of you, you know? Uh, with 3D, 2D characters have to keep in mind the 3D characters, right? So if they're gonna paint something just from one angle of a character, the 3D artist can be like, I have to come up with a whole other three angles. Can you please specify more? Uh, so yeah, with, with a 3D pipeline, you have to keep the 3D people in front of you always. Uh, as a color key artist, I have to keep the lighting team in front of me, right? They have to replicate this in 3D. With live action, movies if you're going to be let's say a matte painter or environment guy who uh, knows that they are going to be either made in 3d or made as movie sets you have to understand that first of all the movie has a budget and if a movie has a budget that means you can go wild on everything right and you have to understand is it an important part of the story like let's say you're going to be designing a village where there's a bunch of houses you can't make every house super unique <laughs> that is going to be passed by in like two seconds right you have to understand how it's going to work and then that how they're going to build it later on with with uh with games right there's other things that you have to keep in mind how are the players going to experience the character well, for example with league of legends right with the league of legends we have every time it's top down view right that we're looking at the character right so if we're going to have design some kind of super cool you know <laughs> super cool little uh, thing in front of the character that is always hidden, right? It's not going to be visible for the player, right? What the silhouette is going to look from the top down, stuff like that. So within the with different genres of the games, you have to uh, keep those things in mind. Um, yeah, so for RPGs, it's one thing. For... Um, you know, for kind of like movie experiences, games, it's, it's a, another thing. For adult battlers, it's a whole another thing. And for you, right, and this is another thing, uh, I prepared a document with a few documentaries of making off. I prepared a making off of The Incredibles, The Lord of the Rings, The God of War game, and Finding Atlantis movie animation, and I think Iron Giant also 2D animated. And also I'm gonna include some uh, diaries of Sergei Pablos, the guy who did the animated movie Klaus. So your homework for this lecture is gonna be this. Listen to all the documentaries, make notes, get inspired, and try to figure out what brings the most excitement into your soul. As I say, whatever tickles your soul or heart. In Russian, I say, <laughs> okay? um, and why is it important? Because you have to be a valuable asset to the pipeline. You have to be excited. You have to love what you do to bring value and you have to understand how everything works because a lot of the times when I talk to artists or I talk to directors a lot of the time they're shocked that I know what 3D lighting team is going to go through next they're shocked that I know what transitional 
transitioning scenes are in movie games. Or for example, when you load from level to level, sometimes the game has to upload the files to load you in the next room. So for example, sometimes um, companies would hide the transition between levels with fog or transition scene, for example, right? And I know all of that because I'm a nerd. I'm excited about all of this. This is what I think and dream about all day. And your job, doesn't matter what your position is in the pipeline, is to understand the inner workings of every detail, right? And we try to go really briefly through everything, but in documentaries, they have two, three hours to actually interview each position in the pipeline, right? And we're gonna have this in this course, right? Because we have more guests incoming, right? But I really encourage you to listen uh, to the material that I'm gonna provide to you. So it's gonna be linked in the Discord and in the description. So be patient, it will be one or two hours after this video goes live, right? But your responsibility, you know, your responsibility before yourself, director, and poor people in front of you and behind you, right, is to understand what they're gonna go through later on. So for example, if you're an environment artist, you're like, okay, what, what am I designing is gonna be made by another person. So let me dumb this down as much as possible or write down extra descriptions that are going to make another person's or human being life much, much, much easier, right? That's our job is to make the, the person in front of us have less pain because we solved one piece of a puzzle for him. And on top of that piece of a puzzle, he can add his little puzzle. And at the end, it's all gonna fit together magically because we are finding those puzzles, right? But the director, that's the main, that's the main guy who fits all of those puzzles together and tries to make it into a full packaged movie. So yeah, your homework is gonna be, watch all of the material, please, that I provide uh, in the description of this YouTube video or in the Discord channel under the homework uh, channel, right? We probably gonna have a watch party for the duration uh, of the rest of this week and part of next week and have a little discussion about each role in the pipeline, what resonated the best with you, right? And where would you love to be useful, right? Because I gotta remind you again that what you do needs to be coming from the heart, you know, it has to be a calling, it has to excite you, you know, because you should be this industry, not because it has a lot of money, not because it's prestigious, right? Not because, you know, someone else said it's cool or you should do it. It's because you have a physical need to tell stories and do what you do, you know? Because there's too many people in the industry right now that do it because I don't know why they do it. Because there's money, um, because they're used to doing it, it just happened. You know, our industry is slowly dying creatively because people find jobs for the wrong reasons in it, right? And your responsibility is to have tremendous love for your craft for being a storyteller, you know, and for being in this creative family. Because I'm gonna tell you right now, if this talk to you was boring, and hopefully not because of me, but because it was just boring to you, you shouldn't get into the industry at all, you know, because there's nothing, there's nothing more wrong than a person doing what they weren't called to do if they're not feeling it, right? We're not gonna always feel doing our jobs, you know, but for the most part, we shouldn't be forced to do it. It's it's what we breathe, it's what we leave, yeah? It's like, if someone's gonna ask you, why are you doing what you're doing? I'm like, well, why are you breathing, <laughs> right? Because it's, it's life, you know? And 
yeah, watch those documentaries, get exp- inspired, uh, write things that resonated with you the most. It could be different things, you know, and just write it down and just, you know, get to know yourself a little bit more, you know, um, find the things that excite you, you know, and, and find your heroes in the industry and try to imitate them. Like, for example, for the movie The Incredibles, uh, the director is uh, Brad Bird, you know, and that's the guy who did Iron Giant. And for production of the Iron Giant, his what he did is he said uh, to his executives, give me the most rebellious artists that don't fit. Give me the most, you know, pain in the butt artists that you hate, you know. And he wanted those people because they knew that they would innovate that they would, if, if, if he would have listened to them, they would have gave the best idea, the best interpretation of Brad Bird's story, you know? And I think that's what's lacking a little bit in the industry nowadays, right? Is creative voices of your own, right? That's why in the first lecture, when I was talking about, you know, connect to your art emotionally and live your life and have something to say, is because of this exact reason is when the right time comes and the right person is directing and stuff like that and you have your time to shine all of your life experiences philosophy mentality things that you're all about are gonna shine through your work because you're gonna connect to a scene or to a character or to an environment or to the story uh, overall of the project that you're on. And then you're going to have an opportunity to do your Mr. Incredible, right? In the movie Incredibles and do your Prince of Egypt and do your own Lord of the Rings and Klaus and stuff like that. Because cinema or story making in any of those forms, right? Be it the games or the live action movies, or 2D or 3D animated movies. It's storytelling, you know, and it doesn't matter what the medium is, right? And right now the industry lacks this. It lacks creative voices that know what they stand for. It lacks, you know, it just lacks personality, man. You know, it's just, there's, it's, it's, it's a recycled industry. You know, I have a pretty disgusting metaphor for this. So you gonna, Please forgive me for this, but our industry looks like this. You know, there's a there's a big there's a big cube, right? And someone great in this cube, you know, <laughs> farted, you know, and that fart is just circulates through the entire thing, and other people are just breathing that in and farting in it again, and there's 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 nothing new, and it just becomes super toxic. And just oversaturated with the same smell. There's no, there's no freshness. There's no nothing. Because people are not investing into themselves. And they're just taking something else from another artist. You know. And that, without adding anything new. And honestly, if, if this artist was a whole pie. At the end of the cycle, there's like a little crumb. That was left. You know. That was left from the original idea. And your responsibility is to like you know experiment um find different things that excite you different stories your own culture you know your, you know your own personality uh study traditional painters uh old movies new movies and make it you know there's an old saying it's pretty cliche yeah it's still like an artist if you're gonna steal uh if you're gonna steal one cent from you know, from all of the artists of the world, you're original. If you're gonna, you know, if you are a hundred dollars and you and you <laughs> and you and you stole fifty bucks from one guy and fifty bucks from another guy, you are a cheap version of those two guys. You know, or a boiled down version of those, right? So, for you to really be useful in this pipeline, you have to bring something extra, something of your own, something of your own soul you know, of your own, your own being into it. Because the pipeline only works if it's called process of adding. Pixar say, do, do that, 
the old pixar i'm not sure about the new pixar right so what you do is you add something of your own the next person adds something of your own and this way you get something impossible because you you get different shades of emotion life experiences uh and and and, and personal life stories of each of, of of each of those people in the pipeline right and at the end you get something super magnificent and amazing and that can't happen if you're not going to be the best version of yourself if you're going to be a mere boiled down version of another person because why hire you if they can hire the real thing right so what i'm saying is for you to understand where you fit in the whole pipeline, you have to understand yourself, right? You know, as, as, as some people say, find your way out of the fart room. Exactly, right? Stop, stop being recycled fumes, right? <laughs> have your own amazing <laughs> cologne, cologne, stuff like that. Yeah, so for you to understand where you fit the best in the pipeline, you have to understand yourself first. What you're good at, right? What your strong suits are, what you're all about, right? Because you cannot be useful in the pipeline if you are, you know, you, you, you can't be, what's the word? <sighs> first of all, you can't be useful, but secondly, you can't, I would say it, um, <laughs> Um, you can't be confident in your abilities and confident that you can provide value, right? If, you, if you're not confident about who you are as a person, what you stand for, because strong personalities, right? You know, uh, developed artists who know who they are. Those are the real people who have a creative voice who can add something, not just paint something pretty because other people told you to do something, because they can add a piece of themselves into the artwork. And that's what I don't see in the industry anymore. Right now, there's too many recycled fart artists. Let's call them that. You know, incubator recycled art artist from the fart room. Okay. Art station is basically a giant fart room. So if we would imagine art station as a box, I deleted it already. Did I delete it? Yeah. So art station is fart room. Have your, you know, have your inspirations from other places, you know. Don't be here. It's going to be toxic. It's going to be weird. You're going to compare to you, yourself to other people um, and try to become some kind of boiled down variation on themselves. So, yeah, uh, first, analyze the pipeline. Listen to the documentaries. Get excited. Turn your inner nerd on. Because the fate of the animation industry technically depends on you, young fella, you know, because you start, you all start from sour, you know, but first of all, you have to get excited, get that inner fire going, you know, see what animation is like. Is it worth fighting for? Because I'm going to tell you, to get in the industry is going to take a lot. Is it hard? Super hard. Is it worth it? That's another question. Because if you love it, it's worth the fight. But if you are not called or you are, you don't have, you know, the inner will to enter the animation industry, when you're going to make it, you're like, oh, I'm not making enough money. This sucks. Blah, 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 blah. Right? Because money, success, and everything else comes as a side effect of you loving what you do. Right? So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to test you while you are going to watch the documentaries. Are you excited? You know, every time when I watch Finding Atlantis documentaries or Making of Klaus, I feel like I'm missing on some kind of a party. That I am missing out. That I was not invited and I'm angry about it. And I wish I was there. Almost nostalgic. You know, if you're going to get the same feeling, I wish you do. Great. First test passed. Second test, right? Do you know who you are? Where do you fit in all of that? How can you provide value? That's the second question. And the third question is like, who are you? You know, what do you stand for? 
what makes your heart and soul tickle, you know? Because if you don't know those things, you know, you don't get inspired, you're not a nerd, when you're gonna get hired, you're gonna be another fart room artist who is gonna give the same answers visual to the visual problems, to the narrative problems. And what industry lacks right now is fresh voices because for too long we just found the right formula that became too old. That's why we get remakes after remakes after remakes. And you are the new generation, the new voices that kind of provide the new stories and new perspective on the world, right? Because, you know, Pixar started from somewhere, Disney started from somewhere, and they found those artists. So, and at the end of the day, if you're going to answer all of those three questions, and you understand who you are, and that you're excited, and you're called, and you know where you're going to be useful in the pipeline, and if you do it because you love it, you know, and because it's like breathing, you know, success will come to you naturally. You know, you'll be doomed for success because of what you do, you know, that's your life. And if you enjoy what you do, you know, at some point you're going to be become really great. And at the right time and at the right moment, you're going to create your own luck and opportunity to gather, uh, not to gather, but to uh, enter those pipelines. Find the people with their own stories and they're going to find you in our station like Borja found me, you know. I was telling my own stories and Borja wanted to tell his own story. And he saw that creative voice and passion and nerdiness in my portfolio. And it wasn't the best, but that was what was in it. The soul, you know, the dedication and the calling. And if you're going to enjoy what you do, I'm going to promise you, 100%, you should be found. You will be found. You know, but it takes dedication. It takes dedication and hard work, but all of that is going to be worth it. So, to recap, do all the things that I said above, love what you do, and you're doomed for success. Watch the documentary, have fun, and yeah, I think this is it for today. We're going to have a pretty short Q&A session after this. I'm not sure if I'm going to record it. I'm just going to briefly scan through the chat. And you know what? Let me do it now. Let me see if I could find questions. You know what? There's too many of them. So uh, I'm going to join the voice chat for people who are watching the recording. You're missing out. Uh, please, 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 please enter our Valhalla for Arts community on Discord because we're having philosophical existential creative conversations almost every day of the week you know and you know what networking and talking to other people is should be part of your creative you know process and you know what honestly it's the most important thing in the industry is finding allies that love what you do also bouncing ideas off them and you don't have to work right now in the industry to get the industry experience of working you know find a comrade find find the group of vikings that you're gonna do an animated project with you know give them feedback they're gonna give you feedback talk about your world talk about your experience talk about what excites you and what inspires you you know and bounce those ideas off other people and you know learn other people's perspective because it's part of the storytelling you know, but most important, find your creative voice because industry needs it. I need it. Everyone needs it because without knowing who you are, there's no good stories, right? And right now, industry is kind of, kind of sucky with with stories. Again, even the Pixar itself and Disney, they are themselves in a big, ugly, fat room. So hopefully, if we become great, we can either create our own fart, fart room and be, <laughs> be creative with it, you know, and uh, generate our own original ideas, you know, or contribute to other people's ideas. Anyway, this is it for today. I'm babbling now. Hopefully this was useful and not too over, all over the place. And we're going to do a quick Q&A session in the voice chat. 
it's going to be unrecorded so for people who listen this after too bad for you please don't you know don't don't miss out on live recordings and yeah stay hydrated skull and please be yourselves that's it for today i'll see you monday Pow.